Always, always run across that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hope that you're having a good week so far and are ready to have an even better week because we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, it's super exciting. I love this book. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I uh, hope that you've grown uh, in your appreciation for God and for Jesus through our study so far and that that will only continue to be the case. Uh, let's go to our Father in prayer and then we'll begin. God in heaven, we praise you so much uh, for Jesus. We praise you for preserving uh, this writing for us in Hebrews to uh, pull the curtain back and just show us the brilliance of your providence, the brilliance of your plan uh, that you had established before the foundation of the world, uh, that even all the complexity of the Law of Moses system, you, you just set up as a tutor uh, really to teach us about um, our relationship with you and where true defilement comes from, um, not from the outside, but from within, from our sinful hearts. And uh, we're so grateful that you sent Jesus to provide the true cleansing, to cleanse us on the inside so that we can now have unlimited access to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the main point of Hebrews, of course, is that Jesus is better than Judaism. And he's hammering that point repeatedly because these Jewish Christians are being persecuted for their faith. So there's a temptation for them to just let go and abandon their faith in Jesus and settle for life as a Jew under the law of Moses' system. Now, I'm choosing that word. This is a word that I have chosen carefully because I used to use the word return, and I don't like that word as much. I like the word settle because Jewish Christians would not have left Judaism to begin with. They would have continued to practice Judaism even after becoming a Christian. So it's not that they're tempted to return to Judaism. And often, I mean, that's how I've said it. I've heard preachers say that for years and years and years. It's just like, it's just not accurate. What they're tempted to do is get rid of Jesus and settle for living as a Jew without Jesus, which is absurd because uh, the entire uh, Judaic system was meant to be fulfilled in Jesus. And so without Jesus, the one who fulfills it all and brings us to a point of perfection, well, then the law of Moses is just empty. You're settling for a system that really is insufficient to take care of your sins and to um, you know, save your soul. So if we orient ourselves in our outline, we see that from chapters 8 through 10, he's arguing from the scriptures themselves, from the scriptures of Judaism itself, that Jesus brings a better covenant. He serves in a better tabernacle. He offers a better sacrifice. In last class, we started talking about this better covenant and even him serving in a better tabernacle. And remember, he contrasted it with the earthly tabernacle. What did we say in the first five verses of chapter 9 was the problem with the earthly tabernacle? <clears throat> okay, yeah, it was temporary. What did you say, uh, Mary? Okay, yeah, it was a copy, or right? it was a shadow. It was, it was temporary. Even, even its very design is very temporary. In nature, it's just a tent. And if you start kind of picking through it, and you realize um, things like the, the lampstand had wicks, right, that needed to just continually be trimmed. You know, the, the, the wicks would need trimming. You would need to refill the oil regularly, you know, for the lamps, because that would run out, you know, and... Um, the showbread had to be replaced every single week. Uh, so it, it, even the jar of manna in the Ark of the Covenant, like that's holding manna, which is perishable. So it's like all these things about the tabernacle design itself is perishable and destined to, to fade away. And really, the ultimate proof of that is that in the first century, they didn't have the tabernacle anymore. It was completely gone. They didn't have any of those items, those furniture items. They didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant anymore which God said that was part of his plan because in the messianic age, God would not need this shadow or copy of his throne over the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, but that his throne would be in heaven ruling over new Jerusalem, the this, this spiritual church uh, over which he reigns. So now he's going to continue his argument about how the tabernacle was less than the true heavenly tabernacle. And the one reason is the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle of the Old Testament system actually blocked access to God. And this is such a brilliant paradox that God set up in the law of Moses system. 
Because on the one hand, the tabernacle was the place where God dwelled among His people and they could live in His presence. But on the other hand, it's a paradox because the whole structure of God's plan for the Levitical priesthood and their interaction with the tabernacle was established in a way that kept people separated from His presence at the same time, simultaneously. <laughs> He's supposed to be dwelling with them in their presence, but they, they still can't really access his, his presence because of the way he set up the tabernacle system. So uh, let's, let's read verse 6 uh, down to the first part of verse 9. Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. So remember, he divides the tabernacle into two tabernacles. You, you have the outer tabernacle, uh, which was the holy place, and then you had the inner tabernacle, which was the most holy place where God dwelled above the Ark of the Covenant. Who was allowed to enter into the outer tabernacle? <clears throat> okay, so they were allowed in the outer courtyard, but in terms of the outer tabernacle, it was more specific. It was just the priests, right? So um, if, if you think about it, here's the first part of the paradox. The tabernacle is the place where God gets to dwell with the Israelites, and they can dwell with Him. But 90% of the Israelites are banned from even entering the outer tabernacle. I mean, that's not even where God dwells. God dwells in the inner tabernacle. So 90% of the Israelites can't even come into the room next to the room where God dwells. Only Levites, and only Levites specifically who are descendants of, of Aaron. And now as for the inner tabernacle, or the... Uh, the, the most holy place where God's presence was, there was only one person in all of Israel that could enter that space, and that was the high priest. And the high priest could only enter that place one time per year on the annual Day of Atonement. So the actual presence of God in the most holy place was so restricted and so blocked that 99.99% of Israelites were blocked from having access to it. And even for the high priest, what had to happen in order for him to even enter into that place, the, the most holy place? What did he have to do even to have access to it? Yeah. Yeah, he had, yeah, he had to offer sacrifices for his own sin before he could even enter that place. So... Um, yeah, I don't know of all, I don't, I can't remember all the things that the high priest had to do, but he did have to like sprinkle, you know, the, the, um, Ark of the Covenant with blood and all that stuff for his, for his own sin and offer an animal sacrifice. I'm not sure about the washings, what specific washings he had to do. But the point is the problem of sin was so bad that even though God was dwelling in their midst, he, he set up the tabernacle system to show them in a very visual, a very spatial geographical, tangible way that their sins were blocking their full access to him even with the help of the priests. And so here's another way to say it. Even the design of the Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle structure itself was meant to show people that the work of the Levitical priests was insufficient to give people access to God. He's showing them that. <laughs> they, they may not quite get that point because God is just absolutely brilliant <laughs> and it won't become apparent until, until later, especially when we're reading Hebrews now. Um, but this is just an, an amazing thing God does with the tabernacle. And in verse 8, there are two ways that verse 8 can be taken. If the phrase holy place refers to the most holy place in the tabernacle, and first tabernacle in that verse refers to the holy place, then the point is 
the holy place where the Levitical priests are continuously ministering is actually blocking access to the most holy place. So he would be saying the only way to get into God's presence in the most holy place is if this thing is no longer standing. If, if the work of the Levitical priesthood in, in this part of the tabernacle is, is removed, that's the only way that, that you could actually have access to God's presence. Now, I actually, I used to take this position. Uh, years ago, this was the position that I held, but I have recently, um, for this class actually, changed my, my view on what he's talking about. Um, for a, a couple reasons, the weakness here is, okay, even if we remove this outer tabernacle part, well, God's presence in the inner tabernacle, in the most holy place, is still very blocked. It's still restricted. Only the high priest can, can go in there. So unless we're just taking him in a very figurative sense and saying, like, that's, you know, just kind of, I don't know, being very metaphorical, uh, it's harder for me to, to take the verse that way. The other way is to interpret the phrase holy place as a reference to heaven and first tabernacle as a reference to the entire earthly tabernacle. So the first and second, right? Holy place, multiple place, the whole thing put together. And, and if that is the point, then his point is in order to gain access to God's true presence in heaven, the entire tabernacle and Levitical priesthood system have to be done away with and removed. That whole system is ironically actually blocking our entry to God's true presence. And that's where I lean now. I, I think that is a stronger, a stronger argument for what he's saying, especially since at the first part of verse 9, he says that the earthly tabernacle system was really just a symbol. It, it's a copy, right? It's a, it's a shadow of the present time when we know that God is dwelling in the true tabernacle, the real tabernacle in heaven. And the implication, of course, is that since Jesus is a greater priest and serves in this greater tabernacle at this present time, we can now have unlimited, unblocked access to God. Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase in Hebrews used five times in, in this book to describe what's possible for us because of what Jesus has done for us, and that's the phrase, draw near. Now, for us, like, we, that might not be that important, you know, like, we might take it for granted, but I think if you were an Israelite living under the temple and the tabernacle system, it would be very clear to you that you couldn't really draw near to the full presence of, of God because of all of that uh, Levitical priesthood and tabernacle system uh, being in the way. But now, with all of that Levitical system and, and priesthood and tabernacle removed, now we can finally draw near to God's presence. We can enter into His presence boldly in prayer, coming before His throne. He talks about that earlier in chapter 4, I think it is. And ultimately, um, we can draw near for all eternity because we'll just be living in the, in the actual presence uh, of God forever. It's such a beautiful, powerful thought and hopefully a motivating thought to these Christians because if they settle for the Levitical priesthood system and give up Jesus, they're settling for something that's actually blocking them from accessing God. <laughs> so stay faithful to Jesus. Comments or questions on those verses? <clears throat> Her. So, I'm not trying to confuse this, right? But according to 1 Corinthians 3 16, don't you know that we're, you know, we are God's temple? So, does that further cement your revised view that we are now God's temple as He's dwelling in us, not in a mysterious way, but we are God's temple? So, we don't need that earthly temple. So I think that's a true statement, but I think I would say that's a different point because the contrast um, there that Paul's making in 1 Corinthians is between the old temple or tabernacle and the, the new temple and the church. But what the Hebrew writer's doing primarily is he's contrasting the old temple or tabernacle with heaven, the true tabernacle in heaven. So there is a sense for sure that as the church, we're God's temple. He even says in 1 Corinthians 6, our bodies are the temple of God, yeah, as well. Um, but then there's another point that God's true temple, right? He's not, you know, just 
again, it's, it's like the physical tabernacle. It's not like God is trapped inside our bodies, right? Or, or God's trapped inside the church, right? You, you wouldn't say that, of course. Uh, it's just imagery. The ultimate dwelling place is, is God, uh, or is heaven for God. Sorry, Tim. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just hammering. I mean, the garden is just incredible. And if you're perceptive, as the Jewish reader of this, if you're a perceptive Jew, Jewish reader, you're just thinking, "Wow, he's he's killing me here. I, I can't I can't argue against this." Yeah. 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 They're Jewish Christians. Yeah. He's using the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, to make his points. Uh, and there's no denying what he's saying if you understand the scriptures. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, uh, good, good thoughts. Uh, so now he's going to continue to talk about Jesus offering a better sacrifice. He's really going to explain the, the, really the main reason why the tabernacle and Levitical priesthood system blocked people's access to God's presence is because of the limitations of the sacrifices that they were offering. And, of course, we'll talk more about that in chapter 10, but he, he gets into it some here. He starts to kind of introduce this concept to us here. So look in verses 9 and 10, uh, the second part of verse 9. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So, again, what God was doing with the tabernacle was representing his relationship, his spiritual relationship with his people in a spatial, <laughs> geographical sort of, of way. So, God's presence dwelled in his tabernacle, and the closeness of your relationship with God uh, was kind of reflected by how geographically close you could come to God in, in his tabernacle. And of course, you know, the Israelites could only come so close, and the Levites could come closer, and the high priest could come, could come the closest. And the only way any of that closeness to God was even possible in the tabernacle was to have a system whereby they would be cleansed from their sins and from any uncleanness whatsoever. So, for instance, if you got a disease like leprosy, it made you unclean, and you had to then dwell geographically, spatially, away from the camp, away from God's presence at the tabernacle, unless you got better. And once you got better, well, then you had to go to the priest, and there was all these, uh, you know, procedures. They had to make a mixture of, like, blood and scarlet and hyssop, and they would sprinkle you seven times with that. And then you had to wash your body, and you would wash your clothing, and then you would have to offer animal sacrifices as well before the priest would then declare you clean, and now you can come back close, you can come back into that, that community uh, closer to the Lord's presence. Now, as you think about that, was it a sin to have leprosy? No. no. Now, it is true, sometimes God struck people with leprosy because of their sin, <laughs> but there was nothing inherently sinful about leprosy. However, in that geographical closeness system of the tabernacle and Levitical priesthood, your leprosy meant you were separated from God's presence until you were made clean again. The same thing is true if one of your family members died in, in your house in the middle of the night and, and you carried their body off to bury them. Well, now you're unclean because you touched the dead body and you can't come into the, the tabernacle. You can't celebrate the feast at the tabernacle and all that because, because you're defiled by that. But again, there, is there anything sinful about touching a dead body? Well, well no. But it would still keep you uh, from, from the Lord. It, it was almost as if you had some sort of imaginary dirt on you that, that made you filthy and now you can't come close to God because of it. And I say imaginary because, again, it's not, it's not like you, you literally were just sinful for, for touching a dead body or even um, for touching a, an unclean animal carcass or women uh, during their, their cycle, uh, their monthly cycle. That, all of that, that laid, labeled you unclean and defiled for a certain amount of time. But there was nothing inherently sinful about those things. This is what the Hebrew writer means when he says that the sacrifices in the tabernacle system were really just regulations for the body. 
They were primarily about external cleansing so that you could now be considered clean in a ceremonial sense. That, that all that imaginary dirt, you know, that, that's been cleansed off of you by the sacrifices and by, you know, sprinkling with blood and, you know, washing and water, all that stuff. And then now, uh, spatially and geographically, you can move closer to, to God's presence. And here's what's interesting. Let's talk about sin now, <laughs> because even when a person did actually commit a sin against God, the prescription was pretty similar. They had to offer a certain number of uh, sacrifices in order to be forgiven and in order to be back into God's presence. And so here's, here's the point. In that Law of Moses system, even your sin in the tabernacle system was treated as if it was defiling you, just like all of those other external bodily uncleannesses, and it would keep you from the presence of God until you were cleansed by the priestly sacrifice. But the problem with that is that none of these external rituals really cleansed the conscience, the, the inside part of us that convicts us of sin. Sin defiles our hearts, not just our bodies. And perceptive Jews would understand just because I eat clean food and avoid touching dead bodies doesn't mean I have a clean and pure heart. And just because I offer animal sacrifices doesn't mean I've actually been purified on the inside. Um, very fascinating. After David's sin with Bathsheba, he says this to God in repentance, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God. What I want you to see is David actually uses the external washing language of the tabernacle. But he's not asking God to actually cleanse him externally with the rituals at the temple. He's asking God to wash me on the inside to cleanse me thoroughly and give me a, a clean heart. And he understands that animal sacrifices can't do that, aren't going to cut it. And so he says later, Psalm 51, you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. David knew it. Even if he offered God a sacrifice, it wouldn't do anything for his conscience because that's, it's not really a fair trade at all. If I sin and an innocent animal dies, well, I'm supposed to be happy now as if I have a cleansed heart. It doesn't really match with the seriousness of what he did. He knows there's something insufficient about sacrificing an animal and that true inner cleansing of sin can only come from God. That is who he's appealing to here. This is why David was a man after God's own heart, right? Because he was perceptive enough to, to pick up on all of this. And he was absolutely right that true inner cleansing only comes from God and, and his mercy and his forgiveness. What he didn't know, though, was that the only reason it would be possible for God to extend that mercy and to give David that inner cleansing was because of what Jesus would one day come to do to provide that ultimate sacrifice. And that's where he goes in this text, verses 11 through 14, that Jesus now has entered the true tabernacle of heaven. And he says, um, verse 11, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So a sacrifice that truly cleanses us from the inside is what Jesus offered us. So that now 
we can have clean consciences that no longer convict us of sin. I, I love how uh, David McClister put this in his commentary. He said, one does not have a complete sense of forgiveness until the conscience ceases to accuse. One does not have a complete sense of forgiveness until the conscience ceases to accuse. Perceptive Jews like David understood even after offering an animal sacrifice, his conscience still accused him of guilt because the, the penalty for his sin wasn't really paid. Only God's mercy could offer David true forgiveness. And in Jesus, God's mercy has offered us that true forgiveness. So now we can know the penalty has been paid in full and our consciences can be clean. And that's true forensically. That's true objectively. Sometimes our consciences condemn us because we're just feeling guilty and we hate what we did and all that. I get that. But objectively, God says, your conscience is clean. <laughs> I've, I've forgiven you in, in Christ. There is, Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just amazing, amazing thought. Comments or questions through verse 14. <clears throat> Yeah, there. Yeah. One thing I've often wondered is this maybe a segue in between the two churches that you have. For me, if I go to and I have sinned, can I go to the escalator and not have to make sacrifice? That would almost make me feel bad. Because this animal did nothing. It doesn't know why it's there. It doesn't know anything. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. Yeah. This man, this whatever, didn't know. Really, and I kind of wondered, did we personally yeah. If he can't think, or at least he couldn't think my conscience, I don't want to work. I guess I would, I would go through mm -hmm. the procedure that God has. Sure. Yeah. So this, if I love God, at the end that time, I do what he asks. Mm -hmm. so that would really bother me. Yeah. And that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to make you feel better. This is how bad sin is. But I don't know that it would make me feel better. Oh, boy, I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Something would just rub you the wrong way about it. Yeah. This isn't a fair trade. This animal doesn't really know what he's doing. Like, he's not even voluntarily doing this. I'm forcing him to be a sacrifice. You know, and he's actually going to make that very point in Hebrews 10 about the voluntary nature of Jesus' sacrifice. But yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're dead, dead on. But unfortunately... Throughout history, how perceptive were the Jews, <laughs> right? How perceptive were God's people? They weren't perceptive at all. And if you can understand what the Hebrew writer is saying here, you'll appreciate better why the prophets had so many confrontations with the people of Israel and why Jesus had so many confrontations with the Pharisees. Because they put so much emphasis on all the external rituals and we've offered sacrifices at the temple and that makes us good people. And God is telling them, I hate your sacrifices. I hate your worship. Just don't even, don't even bother washing in water because your hearts are filthy. That's where the true problem of sin is. You remember the, the Pharisees, they got on Jesus. Well, how come, you know, your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat? They're, they're going to become unclean. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand where uncleanness actually comes from. They missed the idea that God was using that tabernacle system to teach them principles about defilement. And if you're defiled, you can't come near me. You can't have a relationship with me. But what they missed is that the real defilement comes from within comes from our hearts. It doesn't come from the people, places, and things that are around us in our environment. But that's where many of the Jews in the Old Testament and even the Pharisees were, that we're only unclean when we come in contact with people, places, and things around us. And Jesus says, actually, you're unclean because of the heart that's within you. And that's what you really need to cleanse. And that's why it says in Mark 7, in that whole discussion, Mark says Jesus declared all foods clean when he told the Pharisees that. Because Jesus is trying to show them there's nothing inherently sinful about what kind of food you eat. <laughs> that, that, that's not the issue. God was just using the clean and unclean food to teach them principles. And now that you understand what, what it's really all about, it doesn't really matter what you eat in terms of clean and unclean food anymore. It matters who you are and the kind of person you're becoming and the, the heart that you have before God. So that's, that's why Jesus butted heads so much. Uh, makes sense? <clears throat> All right, so, uh, and of course, 
that still has application for us today, right? Is there, is there anything that, that just because I come on Sunday and I take the Lord's Supper, I go through the ritual of taking the Lord's Supper, I drink that juice and I eat that blood, does that mean my heart is clean now? <laughs> no, of course not. It's a celebration of the one who cleans my heart. But it's not, the ritual in and of itself is, is nothing, right? Us coming to church, us singing, or whatever, fill in the blank, good deeds, whatever it is we do, those aren't the things that cleanse us. Jesus cleanses us from within. And then we go and do those things because we've been cleansed by him. So don't make the same mistake that the Old Testament Jews were making with the rituals. We can do that, that same thing too if we're not careful. All right, well, now he makes a point that Jesus had to die in order to inaugurate the new covenant. The key to understanding the section is that the word covenant in the Greek that he uses actually can mean two things. It can mean an agreement to have a relationship, which is what we've been talking about in Hebrews 8. Um, he'll still talk about that uh, covenant in that sense. But it can also mean a last will and testament. So he's now going to kind of mix in the idea of the covenant being a last will and testament in, in this conversation. So he says, verse 15 through 17, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives." So he starts by making a really deep point that I'm not going to get into. <laughs> I'm going to save it till Sunday about Jesus' blood reaching back and forgiving the sins of those under the first covenant. I'm going to talk about that on Sunday, Lord willing, in chapter 10. Uh, but here's where he switches to that last will and testament idea uh, because he says Jesus' death makes this, in, this eternal inheritance available to us. And that's, that's really how all wills work even today. Somebody puts us in their will to receive an inheritance, well, the only way that, that we get that inheritance is after that person dies. And it's the same way here. In order for Jesus to leave us our eternal inheritance, he had to die. This was such a key point for Jews, especially because they had no concept of a dying Messiah. They, they did not ever expect their Messiah to come and die for them. The disciples had a hard time with that, too. Uh, it, was, it just made no sense to them. And the Hebrew is trying to tell them, no, actually, Jesus had to die. Not only because his blood provides us that true cleansing of our consciences, but he had to die so that he could put this new covenant into effect. And now we can have this amazing heavenly inheritance. And it's interesting that uh, covenant agreements in the ancient world usually involve the death of an animal. They, they would make a covenant and then they would kill an animal. And the idea was, if I break my covenant... With you, then may God do to me what we just did to this animal. <laughs> we just killed this animal. May God kill me too if I break this, this covenant. When the Israelites made the covenant with God at Mount Sinai, that's what they did. They sacrificed an animal, and Moses sprinkled the blood on the, on the book and on the people uh, to cleanse them. And so what the Hebrew writer is doing, he's just melding all these points about death and blood and last will and testaments together because the only way we can inherit any of God's blessings is if we're cleansed of our sins and forgiven. And the only way to be cleansed of our sins and forgiven is through death or the shedding of blood. So under the old covenant, in order to be cleansed and to inherit God's blessings, an animal had to die. But in the new covenant, in order to be cleansed and receive God's blessing and even make that new covenant possible, Jesus had to die. So the main point is, since Jesus' sacrifice is so much better, we not only have better cleansing, we have a better inheritance to a heavenly inheritance. That's why earlier in chapter 8, he said Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant built on better promises. We have this nearness to God. Um, questions, comments through verse 22. With a better high priest. Yeah, with a better high priest, absolutely. You, you can stack the betters, yeah. right? <laughs> so, the English Standard Version chooses, I think likely, to use the word will here instead of the okay. word covenant. Yeah. It does. It is very nice. Yeah. Your translation uses the word will there. That's, that's more helpful. I'm just saying that it makes your point for Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, let's um, get to this last section here. Because, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Yeah, we have time to read it. So, therefore, it was necessary for the copy. Well, let me tell you what the main point is. <laughs> Jesus' the sacrifice prepared heaven for entry. 
for us. Okay, so therefore, verse 23, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the, heavenly, uh, in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So in the law of Moses system, even the tabernacle itself had to be sprinkled with blood in order to be cleansed so that people could use it. So that people could, the, the priests could even enter the, the tabernacle. Well, heaven, okay, while heaven doesn't literally need to be cleansed, because there's not like sin there in heaven, uh, and Jesus didn't literally sprinkle his blood in heaven either, flesh and blood are, aren't going to inherit heaven. Um, he's using this figurative imagery to say Jesus' blood made heaven usable for us. Now we can enter heaven because Jesus has, has cleansed and prepared the way for us. Um, I thought about John 14, too, where he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, one of the major ways he does that was to shed his blood on the cross, to, to open up our access to him in, in heaven. He offered a better sacrifice than the Levitical priests because he shed his own blood. He entered a true tabernacle in heaven, and he only had to offer his sacrifice once. He didn't have to keep coming back and dying, right, once a year over and over again. In fact, it would have been impossible for Jesus to do that because um, that's not how God designed humans. Uh, humans die once, and then the next event in our life is, is Judgment Day. Well, Jesus partook of flesh and blood. He, he became everything that it meant to be human, which means he only got to die once, and he did. And that's all that was needed because his sacrifice was so powerful. He didn't have to come back and die multiple times once a year for our sins. He just died one time, and that was enough to provide the forgiveness that we need. And the next major event, well, he's going to come back in the, in the day of judgment. Um, and so that's what we're kind of waiting for, right? He died once for sin, but when he returns, it won't be to die for sins again. He's already dealt with sin. When he returns, this time it's going to be to dole out judgment against sinners and really the more positive, to offer salvation to his followers and to those who uh, eagerly wait for him. Uh, so really the implication is don't settle for a lesser high priest who offers lesser sacrifices and gives us lesser access to an even lesser tabernacle. Right? Put all your faith in Jesus who has opened heaven for us and uh, who one day is coming to save us. Now, let me make an interesting comment here about this idea of eagerly waiting Jesus' return. Because we have writings from the Jews in the intertestamental uh, period that talked about how on the annual Day of Atonement, when the high priest would enter the tabernacle into the most holy place, the people would eagerly wait for his return. They would wait for him to come out of the tabernacle. Uh, one, because, you know, they're kind of nervous, right? If he goes in there and does something wrong, he might die. Or maybe God won't accept the sacrifices on, on our behalf. Uh, and what a horrifying thought that would be. So they're eagerly waiting for the high priest to come out and give confirmation that God has accepted, you know, their, their offering and, and has now cleansed them uh, as a congregation. Uh, he's, <clears throat> there's a writing by Ben Sirach. Uh, whoops, I meant to click that earlier. I just said that by Ben Sirach, how glorious he was. This is the high priest. How glorious he was when the people gather around him as he came out of the inner sanctuary, like the morning star among the clouds, like the moon when it is full, like the shining upon the temple of the Most High, and like the rainbow gleaming in the glorious clouds. My question is, how much more glorious, right? If it was such a glorious thing, awaiting the return of the high priest every year on the Day of Atonement, how much more glorious is it for us to await the return of our high priest from the true inner sanctuary in heaven, in the presence of God, to come and bring us confirmation that God has now saved us and is welcoming us into his, his presence. Jesus, yeah, much better than Judaism. Not even close. It is. It is. 
but I hope that we'll think about these things and try to appreciate them more uh, with each day that passes. Um, that's our time. I appreciate so much your good attention. And we'll pick up in chapter 10 on Sunday, Lord willing.